Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, professorial uh, lecture. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing uh, today's lecturer. And for those of you who don't know Victor, he's more often the man behind the scenes than the man in front of the microphone. For the last many years, he's organised the JHI public lectures four times a year, where he does all of the backstage organisation, um, but is rarely in the spotlight. So it's nice to see that change today, Victor, with you in the, in the spotlight. Victor has uh, researched on um, the dynamics of galaxies, uh, and particularly our own Milky Way galaxy, for many years. He is uh, very highly regarded in this field, uh, both nationally uh, and internationally. He's given many uh, talks, invited talks at conferences uh, around the world. He's organized conferences, most recently a conference organized in uh, Malta that I was fortunate enough to attend, uh, which was uh, a most enjoyable week uh, and very, very informative. Uh, we're very lucky to uh, have him here at UCLan as one of our professors. And uh, he's taken as his topic today, um, our home galaxy, uh, the Milky Way. Uh, as I say, a topic on which he is uh, a leading expert. So I, for one, am looking forward to, uh, to, to the lecture. Uh, I'm sure it'll be uh, highly informative. So without further ado, I hand over to uh, to Victor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Derek, for the introduction. Uh, yes, it's nice to be giving a talk uh, in front of a large audience, which I believe is now not just in the UK. It's it's going off out across the, the world. So at least there's advantages to having to do things electronically online as opposed to in person. Um, I'm going to be talking about the galaxy we live in, the Milky Way. Uh, this is a really good time to be studying the Milky Way. I'm generally interested in galaxies in general, but now is an excellent time to be studying the Milky Way. I arrived at UCLan in 2007. Uh, I've been part of the Jeremiah Horrocks Institute. Uh, and so let me introduce uh, Jeremiah Horrocks. This is the uh, image of Venus over here transiting across the sun and our logo takes its inspiration from that because the, this needed to be a graphic element. Of course, Venus here looks incredibly big. This is a method we apply to find, uh, to find planets around external stars in the modern day. It's still a very useful method. Now, Jeremiah Horrocks, the reason why I'm starting out with Jeremiah Horrocks is this is 50 years before Newton, almost 50 years before Newton, 48 to be exact. Uh, and he is, what he's doing is he's studying the motions of planets within the solar system. We call that celestial mechanics. Uh, I also work in the field of essentially celestial mechanics. I'm not interested in the motions of planets. Per se, I'm interested in motions of stars. How stars move in galaxies, and then that be becomes the field, the larger field of galaxy dynamics, how galaxies evolve and how they form. And that's the subject I'll be telling you about a bit today. So there's a, there's a sort of intellectual kinship between Jeremiah Horrocks uh, and myself. Right, so the story of galaxy formation begins uh, essentially at the Big Bang. And what we're seeing here, this is an image of the residual heat from the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, give or take a few hundred million years. Uh, the universe came into being in this big explosion, essentially. And what we're observing here is that leftover heat that has now cooled down to roughly 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. You can see that this is not a completely smooth map. There are these small oscillations are all, all over the place. And we've now launched satellites uh, over the past couple of decades that have measured the scale of these fluctuations. And on the basis of those fluctuations, we can understand a lot about, about the universe we live in. We see that those fluctuations have a typical size of about one degree. And then additional peaks over here in this uh, distribution of the energies. Based upon how big these peaks are and where they're located, we know what the universe is comprised of. And what we now know is that uh, the atoms that everything that we're familiar with uh, is comprised of is only 5% of the universe. 
but everything that we see in the in the universe, including um, and stars and galaxies, is just this five percent. So we're going to be fussing about the evolution of this five percent in in the universe. Then there is this dark matter. It's about a quarter of the universe. We have ideas about what that is. That's probably a particle beyond the standard model of particle physics. Uh, there's many candidate particles that it could be, but which one it is, we don't really know yet. It took us about 40 years to discover the, the Higgs boson, even though that was predicted um, back in the, in the 60s. So I expect that the dark matter particle will likewise be very difficult to detect or to discover. But that will almost certainly be eventually a Nobel Prize. And this is not really all that puzzling. It's some kind of particle that we have yet to discover. The really puzzling part of the universe is the other three quarters. The other three quarters is dark energy. And we have really very little idea of what that dark energy is. All we know is that this dark energy is forcing the universe to expand faster and faster. It's accelerating, accelerating the expansion of the universe. But we don't know exactly what it is. So. Really, in terms of the topic of my talk, it will be this 5% over here that we can actually see and, and make predictions based on. So here is an example of one of these models, one of these simulations that is run by the illustrious collaboration. We're not part of this collaboration. It's a big international collaboration that ran this big simulation to understand how structure forms in the universe and you're seeing two things here you're seeing the sort of network it looks like a cobweb of dark matter filaments the dark matter collapses into these filaments and then it acts like a circulatory system in, in terms of it drives gas or maybe more a more appropriate metaphor would be plumbing it drives gas to flow along these filaments and where filaments intersect you get gas pooling there and then that gas becomes dense enough that you get star formation, and then you get the those stars becoming galaxies as you as you, as you form more and more stars, you start forming galaxies. And you can see several galaxies in this image. I, I highlight just a few of them. That's a galaxy forming there. You're seeing the stars. There's another galaxy there. There's three of them. This one has a shell around it. What you're seeing there is the gas being blown out by the star formation. The stars. Some fraction of them, when they form, explode as supernovae and they blow out lots of energy and lots of gas with them. And of course, I told you that the dark matter, this bluish stuff, is about 25% of the universe, and the, the stars and the gas, the gas are only about 5%. So, of course, in this image, the gas is being uh, made more prominent so you can see where the things that we can see are. Uh, but in reality, if we were looking at this in the, in the real in the real universe, the dark matter, if we could see the dark matter, would be much more prominent than the gas over here. Unfortunately, we cannot see dark matter directly. It's dark because it does not interact with light. You know, its name is, is really appropriate. So, and at the center of these dark matter halos, what we end up with are these sort of quintessential spiral galaxies that we're familiar with, that we've seen probably before. Uh, you can get the sense that. This is a, a, a disk of stars. It's rotating clockwise here, sort of like my cursor is showing. This is when we look at it from in front of it. If you think of this as a, as a watch, you're seeing, uh, you're seeing this face on, you're seeing the face of the watch. If you look at the watch from the side, you see that you observe this very narrow band of light. This is seeing a galaxy like this from the side. And all of this stuff that we see is taking place at the very center of large dark matter halos. Uh, those dark matter halos will have small subhalo satellites around them. Um, but the parts that we see primarily are these things at the very center. So we're going to try to understand how these things form and how they behave, how they evolve. Um, and so Hubble, back in the last century, uh, gave us a classification scheme for galaxies. We have the elliptical galaxies over here. These are primarily balls of stars moving more or less at random. Then there are the classical spiral galaxies we're familiar with, things, things like this object over here. Uh, and then there is this third branch. Uh, these are spiral galaxies, but they also have a central bar going through the center. And the Milky Way is one such barred galaxy. Here's an example of a barred galaxy over here. The Milky Way has a bar, and its Hubble type, we say, is situated somewhere between these two types. 
So we would say S, it's a, spir it's a spiral galaxy with a bar, capital B, and then the type is somewhere intermediate between C. So we say S, capital B, little b, C. Uh, so that's the Hubble type of the Milky Way. So here's an example of a barred spiral galaxy, just to show you what these things look like in, in real life. Uh, there's the central bar. You will notice the central bar looks a little bit reddish here. That means that the stars here are old. There isn't a lot of star formation taking place. So th this is the bar, and then here in this, in this region is what we call the bulge. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. And then further out here, you have the spiral arms and the disk. And this is uh, bluer, you'll see. It's bluer because there's young stars. Young stars tend to be hot, and so they're bluer. You can see also star-forming regions all peppering the place. Stars can form here, but not so well within the bar itself. So here is an artist's impression of the Milky Way. This is not, of course, the real Milky Way. For us to get a vision of the, like this of the Milky Way, we would have to leave the Milky Way, and that would be a, a, a trip of, of a few million years, at best with, with technology that doesn't even exist yet. So this is just an artist's impression. So you can see in the bar over here, it's the whole part in the center is sort of this yellowish red color. That means there's very little star formation. This is the disk. Again, blue because there's star formation and the artist has also added star forming regions peppering all over the place. Now in the Milky Way, we're not sitting down here. We're sitting somewhere over here. We're sort of in the outskirts of the Milky Way, which is a quite happy place to be uh, because we don't have as many supernovae exploding next to us. This is a happy place to be for life. Um, so that's an artist's impression of what the Milky Way looks like. What we actually see is because we're in the in the plane of the Milky Way itself, what we see in the sky is this band of light. That is the Milky Way. And you've probably been to dark sites and seen the Milky Way look like this. Uh, let me draw your attention to another band of light over here, the zodiacal light. What you're seeing in the zodiacal light are little dust particles that are in the within the solar system, so much, much closer in, uh, and that are reflecting the light of the sun. And we understand from, from you know, elementary science, from our elementary science courses, that this is a band of light because we are, we are in the solar system, and the solar system is uh, a sheet uh, within which the planets go around, within which this dust is going around. So likewise, the Milky Way is essentially this flattened structure of stars, and we are within it. You can also see that there's dust in the, in the Milky Way. Here's a... If we take a deeper image like this, an optical light, that's the Milky Way, this band of light over here. And again, you can see that there's lots of dust hiding the stars in the background and regions of star formation peppering, peppering the galaxy. So that's as we would see it in, the, in, the opti in optical light. Uh, this is, if we go to the infrared, the dust is less important in infrared. This is the near infrared. And then we can actually start seeing some real structure as opposed to just, you know, a band of light. We have what we refer to as the disk over here. There's still dust. We can see these sort of mottled uh, splotches over here. That's dust. But we can see more of the structure. And we can also see that there is, in the center, this thing that sticks out. And this is what we refer to as the bulge. And I'm going to be talking to you about what's happening within the bulge. We've been doing some nice work about that recently and what's happening within the disk and uh, the stock. And just so we're speaking the same language uh, and the, what are the structures of galaxies, at the very center we have a bulge. This is typically all stars. And in the Milky Way, the bulge will be part of the bar. I will show you that in a bit. This is the disk out here. We're seeing the galaxy edge on, so we're seeing this as a very thin layer. Uh, remember, if we'd seen it face on, like you look at your, your clock, at your watch, you would see spiral arms going around. So we're seeing this from the side. This is where there are the spiral arms, this is where there's gas, this is where star formation is happening. And like I said before, the sun would be somewhere over here. A more spherical component, this halo uh, of stars in the Milky Way, that's only about 1% of the stars, so I won't have very much to say about that. That's just stars primarily that have been um, uh, pulled out of satellites that orbit the Milky Way, and the Milky Way has has then cannibalized those satellites, and the, the stars end up on the spherical halo. 
Right, so if we want to study the Milky Way, we encounter immediately two problems, uh, which I'd like to go over very quickly. The very first problem we encounter is we don't really know what the scale of things is. Uh, the, the problem is that measuring distances in astronomy is extremely difficult. And let me show you why. We're familiar that if we try to estimate how far something is, if we close one of our eyes, it becomes very hard to tell exactly how far away something is from us. That's binocular vision. You have two images of something, and that allows your brain to process those two images to tell you how far something is away from you. When we want to determine how far away a star is from us, what we could do is use the same principle, parallax. We could observe the star at one point uh, in the Earth's orbit around the sun, and then observe it again six months later. So when the Earth is over here, and these are much more distant stars, the star will project at this location, uh, and we can measure its location there accurately from the ground. Then six months later, the Earth has gone halfway around its orbit, and we it, the star now projects on this side, and you see that the star is moving between these two different views. And that, by the amount, the amount it moves by, tells us how far away the star is from, from the Earth or from the Sun. And the problem is that these distances are so large that it's incredibly hard to tell how far away the, these, these stars are because the, these angles become really difficult to measure with very little hope of measuring those angles uh, from the telescopes on the ground. So we need to go to space. And even then, it's hard to do except for the very nearest stars. Uh, but that's changed recently. We're living through a revolution in our understanding of the Milky Way. And that has changed because of this satellite, the European Space Agency's Gaia mission, uh, which is doing mostly nothing but very accurately mapping the distances of these objects by measuring these parallaxes. So we are now at a point where we have roughly one year, one, one and a half years worth of data that's been made public that everybody's using, but there will be more data releases. Uh, and it's measured, it will be measuring eventually positions for roughly a billion stars in the Milky Way. And that is leading already to a, a big revolution in our understanding of the Milky Way. So now is a really good point to be studying the Milky Way. The other problem is that space is not, it's not only space that is big, but time itself is also big. Or said another way, things change extremely slowly. So if I show you again this picture of this cartoon of the Milky Way, this artist's impression of the Milky Way, pay attention to what's going to happen next. I'm going to switch to the next slide, and what, what that slide will show you is what this will become in a million years, if we were had the patience to sit around for a million years. And that's this. We've rotated by 1.5 degrees in 1 million years. Now, clearly, we don't have the luxury of sitting around for one million years for uh, for to see this change, uh, that's worse than watching paint dry, um, to say nothing of the fact that we, our lifetimes are not a million years. Um, so we can't actually see this directly. So how do we get around this? Well, one way of getting around this is to take all the physics we understand, put it on our computer, and speed the whole process up and produce models that we can see evolving before our very eyes. Now, at this point, I would generally show a movie of something like that, but unfortunately, if I show the movie online in a presentation like this, you wouldn't really be able to see anything. So I won't do that, but I will show you a few links where you can go see movies afterwards if you wish. This is a supercomputer. This is one that we have uh, that we use a lot for our research. Uh, what is entail what what is required to run one of these simulations is that we need to put in as much of our physics into our models as possible. We need to include dark matter, because we definitely know it's there. We need to include gas. At the beginning, that's mostly hydrogen and helium, because that's what forms in the Big Bang. That gas needs to be able to cool. It needs to be able to settle into the centers of dark matter halos. And then it needs to be able to turn into stars. Some fraction of those stars will be very massive. They live fast. They die young within a million years, 10 million years. These stars. Uh, have gone through their entire lifetime and they explode. That's the blink of an eye for our, in, in cosmic terms. Um, and when they explode so the, as supernovae, they do two things. They inject energy back into the gas. So remember those shells we saw the, uh, early in the, in the illustrious simulation slide? 
that's coming from energy from supernovae. And they also inject into the gas heavy elements, things like iron and oxygen. The role of stars, what stars do is they burn hydrogen and they convert it into increasingly progressively heavier elements, things like iron and oxygen. So I will be talking about chemistry of the, the, the chemistry of stars, basically, the iron, their iron and their oxygen in particular. So what that means is that progressively later forming stars are increasingly polluted by iron and by oxygen. And while you're doing all this, gravity needs to be calculated on all scales. These are moving correctly. So you do the celestial mechanics correctly. And so we're part of a big uh, collaboration, an international collaboration that has developed codes to do all of this. Uh, one of the codes that we've used historically is gasoline. You may recognize this character. That's Kelvin from Kelvin and Hobbes. That was genuinely the, the logo for gasoline for many years. And now we're, we're trying a code called Changa, um, which is better, which runs more efficiently on large you know, supercomputers that are coming online nowadays. So that's how we run these simulations. That's the physics that goes into them. And then we get things that look like this. This is an example of a simulation that we've compared to the Milky Way extensively. Uh, this is an example of a of galaxy simulation visualizer that you can find at this, at this link down here. Uh, you're welcome to go look at this. You can change the orientation at which you see the galaxy. You can change the wavelength at which you see the galaxy. You can see it in the ultraviolet. You can see it in visible light. This is roughly visible light here. Or you can see it uh, in the infrared too to see the difference uh, between uh, the effect of dust in different, in different wavelengths. And there's also two simulations there that you, you can see. There's a barred galaxy simulation, this one, and there's an unbarred galaxy simulation. We've used the simulation extensively for the Milky Way, like I said. So I'm going to be showing you a couple of more images of this one later on. So this is something you're welcome to try out. Uh, and now I'm going to start talking about the Milky Way per se. Uh, this e I'm going to start by talking about something called peanut-shaped bulges, the peanut-shaped bulge of the Milky Way. It's a, it's a funny concept, but when we look at galaxies outside the Milky Way, we often see that their bulges, their central parts, have this funny peanut shape. I hope you can see that. This is, this is not the Milky Way. This is a galaxy called ESO597G036. Um, doesn't matter. What, there's nothing special about it. We're seeing it from the side. We're seeing it edge on. Uh, and uh, I'm showing you this because the Milky Way has a bulge just like this. So let's get to the Milky Way. There's that image that I showed you before in the near infrared again. And now I've done something for you. I've drawn in two horizontal lines. Why have I done that? If you look at this side, I hope you can see that this side looks like it's a little bit taller, let's say, than this side. And what you're seeing there is basically perspective. The Milky Way has a bar, uh, and the bar is not quite pointing towards us. It's at an angle of about 25 degrees with respect to the line that joins us over here to the center of the galaxy. This is the near side, that's the far side. So the near side appears larger to us, just like a person standing closer to you appears um, larger than a person standing further away. That's just simply the effect of perspective, something that since the Renaissance uh, artists have known uh, very well. So what this tells us is the Milky Way has a bar. And that's actually a quite interesting result that we get just from something as simple as an image like this. And in fact, this is the bulge, this thing that stands out over here, is part of the bar itself. The bar is large, the bar probably extends to about this far, uh, but the vertically extended part of the bar is this peanut shape that we see, uh, that is, uh, we, we call that the bulge. And our simulations, the simulation that I showed you a couple of slides back, uh, this one, you see there's a bar in it, and if I look at it edge on, if I look from sort of this direction, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can see in this image, I've chosen a wavelength, which is sort of like the optical wavelength. So you see the dust lane clearly, but you also clearly see the sort of peanut shape. Or you can think of it as an X shape if you want. Sometimes this is called an X shape. Now, this is not how we see the bar of the Milky Way. The orientation at which we see it is not quite like that. It's closer to looking at it from this direction. 
And then when you look at it from that direction, the X shape for the peanut is less evident, evident directly, uh, but it's still there. It's just, we, we happen to not be living at the right time to see an X shape. It's the dinosaurs that last saw the Milky Way like this. I don't know if they had astronomy at the time, but uh, it, was, it was dinosaurs that, that had this view of the Milky Way. Here's another uh, simulation. This was a simulation that was part of a press release we had a few years ago. And this is an example of a simulation with a, with a movie. You can go see the movie. It's ended up on, on Wikipedia uh, with respect to an article about um, the X-shaped bulge of the Milky Way. As you can see much more clearly, there's an X-shaped bulge. But again, we're not seeing the bulge in the Milky Way like this. We're seeing it from sort of this direction. So how do these X-shaped bulges form? They, they seem to be very intimately related to uh, the presence of a bar uh, in two sorts of ways. The bar can either do this sort of bending, we call this buckling, and at the end of that, you end up with a shape like this, or the bar could grow, uh, and as it grows, it traps stars in sort of orbits that produce this peanut shape or X shape, depending upon what you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so we understand that part of the formation of, of these of these objects. However, there were a couple of puzzles related to the bulge of the Milky Way. And let me go over those two puzzles first, and then I will tell you what our solution for these puzzles were. Um, let's again look at one of these simulations. Here is the box peanut shaped bulge or the X shaped bulge. There's, they have a variety of names. If we're observing from over here and we look upwards, we're going to reach a point where there's lots of stars over there. So we expect a peak in the density, then we move further away. We expect a drop in the number of stars that we see. And then we start hitting the other arm of the X, sorry, we start hitting the other arm of the X and we expect another peak in the density. Um, so do we see that when we go, when people go observing? So when people have done this, they found that indeed you get a peak in the, in the density at some distance. This is, this is the apparent magnitude, which is a proxy for distance. You can assume that this is like a distance here. So at this point, you're, you're sitting, let's say, somewhere over there. You're seeing stars that are somewhere over there. Then there's a dip in between. So that's roughly this region here. And then it rises again, and that's when you're hitting this other arm over there. Now, there's something interesting that happens here. So let me go to this figure first to explain what that is. On this axis, what I'm plotting is what we call the metallicity of the stars. That is how much iron there is compared to hydrogen, and it's all being uh, measured with respect to the sun. So these are stars over here that have a lot of iron. These are stars that have very little iron. Uh, zero would be the metallicity of the sun, and these would be stars that have um, about 10% of the metallicity of the sun. Uh, so we, we refer to this quantity as the metallicity, uh, how, much, how much iron there is inside the star, uh, on the surface of the star. Uh, so these are what we call metal-rich stars because they have more iron in them than, than the sun has. And this double-peaked distribution of stars that I was telling you about was for the metal-rich stars. But now let's look at the metal poor stars, those that have about one tenth the amount of iron as the sun has. If we look at the distribution of those stars, that has just a single peak. So even though we're looking at the same direction, we don't see two peaks, a peak there and a peak there, we see a single peak. And that's very puzzling because all these stars are evolving in the same galaxy. All these stars are feeling the same potential, gravitational potential, so why should stars with high metallicity behave way and stars with low metallicity behave another way. And that was a big puzzle for us when we started doing this work uh, a couple of years ago. So that's one puzzle. The second puzzle is this figure over here. Imagine we're sitting over here, this is the sun, and we're looking towards the galactic center, towards the center of the galaxy, and there's a bar. And we can measure an angle alpha, which tells us what the average distance of stars is away from us. Now imagine we can do this for different for stars of different ages. We can do that for stars that are called minor variables. We can easily measure something that is like an age for them. So these are young stars, young here being about 3 billion years old. 
These are old stars over here, 13 billion years old, almost as old as the universe itself. And we measure this angle alpha. And the more elongated this bar is, the smaller alpha it will be. Uh, um, so, uh, oops, what happened there? There we go. Um, so when we when we measure this alpha as a function of stellar age, what we find is that the young stars have a strong bar. This is very elongated. Whereas the old stars are quite a bit round, they're almost perfectly round. Again, these are stars all in the same galaxy and the same potential. Why should there be a difference between them? So let me show you how we use simulation to understand these two puzzles and come up with some interesting new science around them. So here's a simulation here. We're seeing it from the side. We're seeing the galaxy before anything interesting happens. That's what we started with in this particular experiment. And then we divide the stars in this in this galaxy into five groups. There is a group where the stars are moving on roughly circular orbits. And then there's the group of stars that are moving on much more elongated orbits, much more elliptical orbits. And we want to see what happens to those different sets of stars. So let's look at the stars that are on nearly circular orbits. After the system evolves and the bar forms and the bulge forms, what we see is that there's a quite elongated bar within it. If we look face on, if we look uh, from above, if we look from the side, it's relatively thin uh, structure and it has a quite prominent peanut shaped or X shape as you want to refer to it. If we look at the stars that started out quite elliptical in their orbits, we get something that is a much rounder distribution, less barred than this, quite a lot thicker when we look from the side. And if we go looking for an X shape, we don't see it. So what's happened here is just on the basis of what the orbits of the stars looked like initially, after the bar forms, those get transformed into these very different sh shapes. And then we can look at the simulations that have star formation, et cetera, and look at that in detail. These are the stars that formed very early. These are the oldest stars in the simulation. These are slightly younger stars in the simulation. And you can see by eye immediately how this is much more elongated than this. This is a quite weak bar. This is quite round. This is significantly more elongated. And that reminds us of this measurement uh, that was done in the Milky Way with these Myra variables. We did a very similar sort of measurements and we get comparable results. The bar is strongest in the youngest stars that had the most circular orbits. If instead we look from the side, so in, in the Milky Way, we would be observing sort of from this direction. You don't see any clear uh, peanut shape here, uh, or uh, we, we don't have an X shape showing up clearly. But if we look at slightly younger stars, we have a very prominent um, peanut shape appearing in these stars. So this is doing things like is like we're seeing in the Milky Way. I remind you again that in the Milky Way, it's the metal rich stars that are have two peaks and the metal poor stars have a single peak. If we take our simulation and look at the very oldest stars, they have a single peak. Whereas if we look at slightly younger stars, still very old, but slightly younger, we clearly start seeing a double peak developing. And so basically our interpretation of the observations is that what we're seeing here is the difference between very old stars and still old stars, but not quite as old. Uh, so the slightly younger stars will be more metal rich because remember they're polluted by earlier generations of stars, whereas the very oldest stars are not polluted so much by earlier generations of stars. So the metal, metal poor represents the very oldest stars, metal rich represents slightly younger stars. And what's happened is that the initial orbits of these stars has made them behave differently once the bar forms. And this is a process that we discovered that we refer to as kinematic fractionation. This is a paper we published just you know three years ago, and we've been doing a lot of work around this. This is uh, consuming a fair bit of our energy at this point because we we're understanding something very important about the Milky Way. Now, what I've shown you so far is that we can understand what we observe, but in order for this to be proper science, we need to not just explain things, but also make predictions, uh, and for those predictions to be tested. That's the process of science. 
So one of the things we predicted is what the average age of stars should look like in the, in the bulge. So we found that the oldest stars should be sort of along the center line. Ignore this deeply blue stuff, that's the foreground disk. So that just gets in the way. The very oldest stars are over here. And then you see sort of a bracket of slightly younger stars uh, over here. Oops. And slightly younger stars over there. And the bracket, the opening open bracket side is a bit more prominent than the closed bracket side. Now, this has been uh, tested with Gaia uh, by these authors here, just, just this year. Uh, three years after we predicted this, they find the oldest stars along the middle of the Milky Way. There's a kind of bracket on this side that uh, is more prominent than a bracket on the opposite side over there. So pretty much all the predictions contained in this, in this model about the age distribution within the bulge are confirmed uh, three years later by, by these observations using Gaia. There's other, there's other uh, predictions we can make and other tests we can make. Uh, for instance, using the Hubble Space Telescope, Clarkson in 2018, two years ago. Uh, we are doing things that are sort of very current. Um, noted that the young stars at the center of the Milky Way are in the, in the bulge are rotating more rapidly than the old stars. So this is the velocity over there, and that's the distance from us. The young stars reach velocities of, let's say, 40 kilometers per second, whereas the old stars only reach about, let's say, 10 kilometers per second, 15 kilometers per second. Our models do the same thing. The young stars now are blue here. They're rotating much more rapidly than the old stars are doing. And what we're doing now is we're using the simulations to predict how the motions will differ for young stars and old stars, uh, and for, for if nothing else, the, the how strong the bar is in the young stars is very different from how strong the bar is in the old stars. That's shown by these yellow contours over here. And we can then make that measurement uh, in the Milky Way, and that will be something that we'll be, uh, we'll be doing uh, later this year. So that is uh, one way of making predictions that can be tested. Another way of making predictions that can be tested is to make predictions about other galaxies. We study the Milky Way for two main reasons. One is it's not to do with the fact that we live within the Milky Way, although that makes it interesting. But one reason we study it is because we can study the Milky Way on a star by star basis. We don't see it as a galaxy in total like this. We see stars, so we can actually study it in great de greater detail than we can study other galaxies. And our, another reason for studying the Milky Way, which is very important, is that the Milky Way is actually a quite typical sort of galaxy. It's not unusual. And I'll show you one slide of that later. And that means that as if we understand how the Milky Way formed, we're starting to understand how galaxies in general form. So we can make predictions for other galaxies. This is NGC 4710. Uh, here it is over here. Uh, and you can again see this peanut shape over here or the X shape, depending upon what, how you want to think about it. Now, what we can do in the simulations, we can, uh, we can predict what the average metallicity will look like. Uh, and what the average metallicity is shown as here is these colors on these black contours. And you can see that when we do that, these, these are, this metallicity distribution is extremely peanut shaped. Uh, it's got this very prominent sort of peanut shape in the center. The density instead is this red contours. You see that the, that the metallicity is more pinched, is very pinched along this axis. When we do these measurements for NGC 4710, we can do that using uh, telescopes, the very large telescope in Chile. We find that the density follows these dash, dashed curves. That's in this galaxy, whereas the metallicity follows the solid black curve over here, you see it's much more pinched than the density itself. And so that this prediction is confirmed. We can use these simulations also to predict uh, or, to, or to develop techniques for identifying uh, these sorts of uh, peanut shaped bulges, but when we're not looking at them from, from this edge on view, when we're looking at them sort of more face on, so a galaxy like this. And the signature of that is that you see a boxy region in the center, and then there are these fingers sticking out at the side. And this has allowed us to study the statistics of how often barred galaxies have these peanut-shaped bulges. And it turns out that it's a very strong function of mass, the stellar mass, that's what we're seeing there. 
This is the fraction of barred galaxies that have these peanut-shaped bulges. And the Milky Way is sitting somewhere over here. It has a mass of uh, 10 to the 10.6 solar masses, about 100 billion solar masses. Um, and for those types of galaxies, you see that 80% of galaxies, if they have a bar, they will also have one of these peanut-shaped bulges. So in this sense, again, the Milky Way is not an unusual galaxy. We can extend this technique also to galaxies that are formed in the early universe that we're seeing in the early universe. This is roughly 8 billion years ago. You see, at that early time, we actually don't find galaxies with these peanut-shaped bulges. We're learning something uh, about how galaxies are forming in the early universe. OK, so that was sort of a little bit of chatting about what we've done about the bulge of the Milky Way, and that is uh, work that is that is fairly recent. I'd like to go back to work I was doing when I first arrived at UCLan um, and tell you about sort of this work we did that drove a paradigm shift in, in galactic and galactic well galactic archaeology is what we call it. So what is galactic archaeology? Galactic archaeology is the idea that if you have a star forming here in a galaxy, it's going to go around indefinitely at that distance from the galactic center, at that radius away from the center. And then we have this idea that galaxies form from the inside out. Stars form in the inner Milky Way first, and then at progressively larger and larger radii. So that meant that we would be able to disentangle galaxies once we had data like uh, Gaia, like an onion. We would understand, we would see the stars in our, in our in our vicinity first, we would understand what their age distribution is, and that would tell us how um, star formation has, has evolved in the, in the solar neighborhood. Uh, and that's, that's known as galactic archaeology. The problem is that we've realized since then that actually that doesn't work. And the reason why, at least not in that simple sense, and the reason why that doesn't work is because the assumption that a star formed at a certain radius will stay at that certain radius was wrong. And I'll show you why in a minute. But here is our simulations showing that. Let's suppose we look at stars in the solar neighborhood at about eight kiloparsecs from the center. Now, this is where those stars are now. But this distribution over here shows you where those stars form. The majority or a large percentage of stars in the, in the solar neighborhood didn't form there. They formed somewhere else. And this is work I did with a former PhD student, Rob Kroshka. Uh, Right. So what is causing what is causing these stars to go around and then move to a different radius? Well, you can see clearly that there are these spiral arms here and those spiral arms. What they're doing is the same as what's happening here. This is what we refer to as a wave particle interaction. I don't need to explain the wave over here. It's very clear. But the, the, the surfer is acting like a particle. The surfer is gaining lots and lots of energy from the wave that has plenty of energy to spare. And what's happening is, in the case of stars, the wave is the spiral arm. The spiral arm is a density wave. It's a peak in the density along, uh, along this region. Uh, and so because there's an excess density over there, there's an excess gravity, and it attracts things towards it. So how do you, how do you, you know, catch a wave like this? Well, the, te the term itself tells you. You need to initially paddle furiously, so you're moving at the same speed as the wave, and then once you're moving at the same speed as the wave, you're basically at risk with respect to the wave, and then the wave can just carry you along for very large distances. What's happening is the surfer is dropping, but as he's dropping, the wave is also moving forward, so he's constantly staying stationary with respect to the wave. He's not bopping up and down, unless he wants to move a little bit down or up, uh, and gaining lots and lots and lots of energy from the wave. And that's exactly what the stars are doing. And so here's a few examples of that. Here's one star, for instance. It's formed at this radius and then suddenly jumps to a different radius. It goes around in a roughly circular orbit over there. And then suddenly it jumps because it, it's, again, hit one of these waves. It's hit a spiral and it moves to a very different radius. So you start off in the blue. You jump to this, blue, to this green radius. You go around there for a while and then you jump to an even larger radius uh, in time. Uh, and these jumps are quite sudden. And the really interesting thing about these jumps is that they leave you on nearly circular orbits. So that makes them very hard to identify because you can't use, you know, something like how, how much this star is oscillating in and out 
to determine whether the star has migrated or not. Now, this is, this is the models. Uh, do we see evidence of that in the Milky Way? And the answer is yes. We go back to our old friend, the metallicity. This is observations in the Milky Way. Um, remember, I told you that the galaxy forms like an onion. The inner parts form first and the outer parts form later. Because the inner parts form first, they reach high metallicities earlier. And then if we look at their, the distribution of metallicities of the stars, that looks like this. There's a peak. Uh, and then there's a really long tail to increasingly low metallicities. So that is what the metallicity distribution looks like for stars in the inner Milky Way. If we look uh, at the outer Milky Way, uh, we notice a few differences. This is the outer Milky Way, the yellow. First of all, the average metallicity or the peak metallicity, if this is the peak metallicity here, it's much lower uh, in the outer part of the Milky Way. Uh, and that's basically because the, the gas hasn't become as, as, as polluted yet by these metals from earlier stars. So it has lower metallicity. And the other clear thing that you see is that the distribution of metallicities is now skewed not towards small values, but towards large values. So what is happening here? So this is stars that have formed. There's always been a fair bit of star formation in the inner Milky Way, and we, this is what we expect a metallicity distribution function, which is the name of this thing, to look like. For the outer parts, while there are no stars forming early on there, there are stars from the inner Milky Way migrating outwards and producing this very long tail to um, high metallicities. But this region hasn't yet reached these sorts of metallicities. It's star formation has started there too recently for that to have happened. So let's first compare the observations. Oops, let's first compare the observations with the Milky Way. The observations, this is from a survey known as Apogee, are shown by this triangle, these triangles. Those are what the, uh, uh, the observations tell us. This is radius, where in the Milky Way we're looking, versus this thing, skewness. This is the black curve. The inner Milky Way is skewed towards negative values. The outer Milky Way is skewed towards positive values. This is the inner Milky Way. This is the outer Milky Way over here. Now we can look at the simulations. The simulations are the circles, and we've colored them. You'll see why in a minute. Um, this is the inner Milky Way. It compares very nicely with the skewness we observe in the Milky Way. This is at a radius, so roughly comparable to the where the sun is. Uh, very similar skewness in the model and in the Milky Way. And that skewness increasingly gets larger and larger as you move to larger radius. Now, what's interesting is we can do this in the simulations because we know where stars are being born, but we cannot do this in the Milky Way because all we see is one snapshot. Now, we can take these points and we can plot them at that same skewness, but now on the horizontal axis, what we're plotting is the percentage of stars that migrated to that location. And you'll see that by the time you get to sort of the solar neighborhood, 50% or so of stars have migrated to that location. The sun very likely did not form where it is. Like I told you earlier, the sun probably moved uh, from the inner Milky Way where things are a little bit more violent and dangerous for life to where it is sitting now in the sort of quiet suburbs. And I'll let you draw your own, uh, we're all migrants basically. Uh, I'll let you draw your own political conclusions from that if you wish. I'm going to switch now to talking about things that we're hoping will drive a new um, paradigm shift in our understanding of, of the Milky Way. This is work that has started very recently, uh, since last year. Uh, and that is that when we look at galaxies in the distant universe, we often find that they contain clumps. These clumps often have masses of about 100 million solar masses. We see them also in galaxies more nearby, but they're less common. For galaxies at about uh, that are um, about 12 billion years old now when we observe them, so they were very young by the time, by the time they were forming, uh, roughly 50% of galaxies at this large distance uh, had these clumps in them. Uh, that would be about uh, more than halfway across the age of the universe. Here's an example of our simulations, and you can see that they form clumps. And if we process these images to look like what the Hubble Space Telescope would see, we see things like this. This is in looking at different wavelengths. This is HUDF, that's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. That's the deepest image we have of the universe. 
uh, and we can see galaxies that look very much like this. Uh, this is much nearer by galaxy, but you can see that the, the structure, these little clumps that we see are comparable to the ones that are observed. So what is the effect of these clumps? Um, and to explain that, I'm going to go back to chemistry uh, and, and explain uh, the, the other element that we've been looking at. So I've told you about metallicity, so how much iron there is relative to hydrogen. So remember, typically what happens is stars, if you look at it just a single location, stars get progressively more metal rich. This value gets larger uh, as you look at stars that form later and later. So we understand, whoops, we understand iron. Let's see if we can understand this other element, alpha. So alpha could be elements like oxygen or magnesium. Uh, those type of elements are produced by very short-lived stars. These are the stars that will live for a million years or 10 million years, and then they explode very violently. And what they do is they produce a lot of oxygen compared to iron. Whereas iron is produced by longer lived stars, typically a star that are orbiting each other, mass passes from one star to the other, and then that star becomes too heavy and it explodes. But that takes time to happen. So this will, this will happen on order of, uh, let's say a thousand million years, a, a giga year, a billion years whereas this happens on the time scale of about 1 million years to 10 million years. So this tells you about regions or stars that have formed in regions where there's a lot of star formation taking place, whereas this tells you about longer term evolution of, of, of the chemistry. Now, in the Milky Way, we refer to this as the thick disk and we refer to this as the thin disk. You notice I put quotes there and I'll show you why we do that in, in a moment. But this is the Milky Way. This is observations. This is, again, aperture. If we look at our simulations, uh, what we see is there is one cloud up here of stars, and there's another cloud up here. And this is work that one of my PhD students did, Adam Clark, uh, just last year. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, and what is happening is that this upper track over here is being produced by clumps, by the chemistry of clumps, which have very intense star formation, and they produce a track like that. And then there's a little bit of a gap, and there is this thin, thin disk over here with more typical star formation like we observe now. Uh, why do we call them thin and thick disk? If I, if I separate, if I draw a line over here, let's say, and separate these stars from these stars and then plot what they look like, this is if I look at them face on, this is if I look at them edge on. For the thin disk, you'll see that they're concentrated near the mid plane. For the thick disk, they're much fatter vertically. They're much more widely distributed. Uh, the thin disk, this is the density here versus the height. The thin disk tends to be comprised of stars that are poor in oxygen, uh, whereas if you go to higher, larger heights, you're looking at stars that are very rich in oxygen. Uh, so we've been working on this. This is a new idea in terms of how to get this chemistry of the Milky Way right. We're doing a lot of work related to that. Here is one example from a student working in my group, Joao Amarante. If we look at the Milky Way, this is the real Milky Way here. We can see sort of four regions. We're plotting the metallicity over there versus the velocity. These are stars that are more or less in the halo. These are stars that came in as satellite galaxies that were uh, consumed by the Milky Way. But then we see there's a thin disk over there, there's a thick disk over there, and then there's the splash region, which includes stars that have very little rotation, and some of them are even rotating up in the opposite sense to the to the rest of the stars. We can produce such stars in our in our simulations with clumps. If there are no clumps in our simulations, we don't produce these very low angular momentum stars. Uh, and of course, we don't have in these particular simulations we don't have the satellites falling in. We are actually exploring what happens when satellites fall in too. So we can produce something that wasn't known up to, well, a couple of years ago. Uh, these simulations weren't produced, weren't run to produce these things, but we're actually finding that we can produce these things automatically, naturally in our simulations. We're also finding, this is now with my postdoc, that if we look at the oldest stars in the Milky Way, in the observations, again, apogee, there's old stars and there's young stars and roughly not quite equal, but comparable proportions. And we get the same sort of result in the simulations that the old stars uh, are both in the 
a thick disk and in the thin disk. That's an interesting idea. Historically, people have thought that you only form the thick disk first and then you form the thin disk afterwards. Uh, we're showing that that's not the case. Uh, and the last topic I'd like to talk about before I finish off is uh, work about the outskirts of the Milky Way. And if you look at the outskirts of the Milky Way, if you have the galaxy sitting more or less flat over here, at larger and larger radii, it starts to bend away. Uh, we call this uh, the Milky Way is warped. Uh, what you're seeing there is the effect of gas coming in. Remember, we had that filamentary structure of dark matter, and that drives the gas in towards the center. Here's an example from one of our simulations now. Uh, the gas is coming in this way, and it doesn't need to be coming in at the same orientation as the disk is. And I'm showing you this image because this is also a movie that you can look at if you want to, an animation that you can look at. And this showcases a software we developed in collaboration with Laurent Noel in computing. We call this Galaxy Flyer. We use this a lot for public outreach. We take it to a lot of places. Um, what we found in that simulation is that these galaxies are tilting, and these galaxies are tilting, galaxies that look like the Milky Way, are tilting at a rate of about five degrees per billion years. If you remember at the start of my talk, I told you that the, that the bar is rotating by about 1.5 degrees every million years. This is a thousand times slower than that. You need to wait a billion years to see something happening if you want to see it directly. The amazing thing is that this is the limit. This red line is the limit above which Gaia will be able to measure the tilting of the Milky Way. And even this incredibly small five degrees per billion years is something that Gaia will be able to detect. It's, it's very remarkable. Um, Gaia really is leading a, a revolution in our understanding of the Milky Way. We haven't measured it yet. We will need to wait till the last data releases for that, but it's measurable. We have simulations with warps in them, uh, and one of my students is studying where stars that are born in the warp that are born out here. This is the gas you're seeing. This is the, the main galaxy, and then this is the warp bit, where stars that are born there end up, and where what we're finding is they end up contaminating the thick disk, and this will be work that we'll be submitting very soon uh, to, to journals. So um, I'd like to end then by introducing my team to you, uh, since they are the ones really who do most of the work. Uh, I just get to tell them, to boss them around, to tell them what to do. So it's only fair that they get a little, a little bit of a shout out. Uh, Adam Clark worked with me uh, to study clumps. Uh, he, he was the one who noted that the clumps were producing this chemical thick disk. Uh, Sam Erb worked with me to understand how disks are tilting. Uh, both Adam and Sam have now graduated and moved on. My current PhD students are these three over here. There's Tigran Kachaturians, who's studying stars formed in the warp. There's Joao Amarante, who is studying uh, the splash population I told you about. And we're now extending that to include satellites falling in. Stephen Goff Kelly is working with me to understand uh, the bulge kinematic fractionation to advance that work forward. And my postdoc is Leandro Beraldo Silva, who's working on a variety of topics. He started out studying the chemistry of the thick disk and the, 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 the properties of the thick disk using clumps. He's now also working on, on war populations and also on understanding the splash better. And then I also collaborate with the group of Joseph Caruana at the University of Malta. And together here we are co-supervising Carl Fitani over here. Carl is working on understanding uh, the effect of clumps on the kinematics of stars in the disk. And I'll end like I begin all my group meetings by telling you a little bit about funding. None of this work would be possible without funding. We've had funding from the Science and Technology Facilities Council. SDFC, it's quite a mouthful, uh, for the past roughly nine years. We've had European Union funding through a cost uh, collaboration network that we, they, that we, we had at, at the university. We've had funding from the Royal Society uh, that, that made possible colleagues in China. And then we haven't brought money in ourselves directly from NASA. We can't do that because the NASA is an American a body and funding agency, uh, but we've worked with people who, in collaboration with us, applied for funding to both NASA and to the ANR in France. And with that, I think um, I'm finished and I'll head back to you, Derek. Thank you. 
Wow. So, uh, Victor, uh, can I just say uh, on behalf of the faculty, what a fantastic uh, lecture. I'm always amazed, I must admit, uh, you know, when all the colleagues from the JHI do these sort of talks, uh, I'm I'm absolutely uh, blown away by by what you guys do, what the, what the team does. And I think what that showed to me, amongst all other things, is, uh, as you indicated at the end there, that this is a uh, a team effort uh, and research is not a sole uh, activity. It's something that, that brings together a community of, of like-minded people who want to challenge themselves and, and, and develop uh, understanding of particular areas. And, and this is a really fascinating area. So, you know, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think the other thing is that, you know, it's something that you, you not come to Quickly, it's obviously a, a lifetime of work here, and it's something that you've developed over a long time. And, uh, and again, that's really evident in what you've talked about today. Certainly, uh, as someone with very little knowledge of your area, I uh, I'll be just uh, looking at the sky with a totally different view now. And <laughs> I'm glad I've inspired that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have, you have, and uh, and uh, I think that the other thing that struck me was how you know, sometimes we think of science as quite siloed, uh, and by that I mean, I suppose, very specific subjects, but actually your research struck me as something that drew together a whole variety of sciences as we would think of them, or as perhaps uh, the public would think of them. Uh, and, um, and one you didn't re really mention, but I know is very much uh, at the back of this around computing and computer science that you, you do a lot of work on, uh, you know, all this modeling that you do, the data that you do is uh, requiring really high powered performance uh, computer facilities. So, uh, so you know, not only you're drawing on physics and astro and, and chemistry, but you're also drawing on computer science as well. So, you know, congratulations to you. Uh, you know, a really worthy professorial inaugural lecture. So thank you very much. Sorry, we can't be in an auditorium to give you a proper round of applause, but maybe, maybe uh, uh, on the on the on the talk today can do something. I don't know. Um, put something in the chat, or uh, you know, raise their hands or something, or just to show their their appreciation for what we heard. <laughs> if if anybody has a question for Victor, you're welcome to raise your hand. I think we've got um, somebody yeah. who's put their hand up already. Let me just find out who that person is. Here we go. I can't see anybody with a hand up. Um, so would anybody like to ask any questions? Or would you like to put a question in the chat function? Don't be shy now. Oh, Derek's, Derek's got his hand up. Yeah, go for it, Derek. Got a question? I can't mm -hmm. see any hands here. Derek, do you want to ask something? You've got your hand up. Hi, thanks. Yeah, my, my network my network's playing up. <laughs> my network is playing up today. Has, has been all there. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, well, Derek? We could. I think he's typing, truly. Oh. I think. Oh, I think he's you typing your question, Derek. Oh, Can no. You, I have network problems. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Derek, yeah, we can hear you. Can hear me? Yeah. Jolly good. Um, no, I was just going to say, Victor, that the um, the Milky Way is is, is obviously a, a, a much more uh, interesting and um, much more complex place than we than we realised it was even when when I when I was a student. Um, 
you know the the bulge was spherical and the disc was was flat and 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 so on we didn't know about warps and peanuts and such like but i was just going to ask by what factor does the uh is the the star formation rate increased by dint of having um by dint of having the bar so within the bar itself, if you remember when I showed you the early images, the bar suppresses star formation. What it does is it drives gas to the very center. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I still have control over my presentation for some bizarre reason, techno technology. But well, anyway, what it does is it drives gas to the very center, and some of that gas could end up uh, within, the, within a black hole, if there is a black hole. But most of it will settle in a ring. Uh, and you enhance star formation in that ring at very small radius. But fundamentally, star formation is not vastly affected by the presence of the bar, not, not substantially, not by more than a factor of, a, of two, let's say. Uh, what it does is it, it, it changes the profile of star formation, where the star formation is happening, but not so much the overall star formation, because that's driven by the gas reaching the galaxy along these filaments, and that's what sets what the star formation rate is. How much fuel do you have from it? Okay, okay. How much of it is blown back up? So, so let me ask you a quick question as well. So, if, uh, in terms of you know, the future, uh, and I'm not talking about the millions of years you just talked about, but in, the, in terms of the next few years, uh, maybe the next decade or two, what what other areas of um, research and, and development do you expect us to learn about the Milky Way? What are the new things or the current challenges? So I, I think, yeah, some of the current challenges, one of the parts of the Milky Way that is hard to study is the vertical evolution of some of these galaxies because it's really hard to resolve properly. So we would like to understand better uh, what, the, what the Milky Way is doing in the vertical structure. Uh, that we will be getting next year, we're going to be getting data release tree from Gaia, which will give us much more data we will be able to constrain one very important thing for my group will be to constrain the ages of stars and then we can start dissecting the evolution of the milky way in greater detail rather than just looking at sort of snapshots now uh what my grant applications are focusing on are these properties as a function of age because we'll soon be able to do these things as a function of age and that will be extremely important for now what we've been doing is we've been using the metallicity as a proxy for age, but it's not a really good one. So for the future, ages will, will start matter. And that will also rely upon data that is coming from satellites, like the ones I mentioned before, that are looking for these sort of eclipses or these transits of, of planets across stars. Uh, one of the byproducts of that sort of work is that we can see stars flickering, oscillating, mm -hmm. and that we are able to use to get very reliable measurements of the ages. And so we are at a, we really are sitting sort of at a point at which there will be a tipping point in our understanding of the evolution of the Milky Way. Things like that are, are what's going to be very important. And of course, on the on the theoretical side, the improvement in computing and the software that we use to attack the problem with uh, mm -hmm. going to make things much uh, much easier to, to test. Uh, some of the some of the work I've shown you here, there are there are simulations here that have taken me many many months to run. One of them actually took a year to run. Uh, we'll be cutting that down significantly, and that makes you know makes makes things easier for us. Super. Um, Demetrius, you had your hand up before. Would you like to ask Victor a question? No, it's okay. It's, it was the same uh, question like I, like Ian about the future, so I'm covered. Oh, right. Thanks. <laughs> No problem. Stole, stole your thunder. So, Victor, let's uh, let's wrap it up and uh, let's just say uh, um, really well done again. And um, I'm sure on another occasion it'd be great to to get a group of colleagues together. Um, you know, maybe celebrate uh, in a different way. And uh, but but really well done. Uh, fantastic to hear about all your achievements. And I certainly learned a lot today. So, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Victor. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Congratulations. Thank you.